989. Welcome to 989 on Health, where you don't need years of university to understand the latest news about health and related subjects. As always, we've created a list of helpful links on today's topic at our website, level989.com, and those same links should also be visible in your podcast playing app of choice. This is an informal discussion sharing our personal viewpoints on health and wellness. Don't rely on the information in this podcast as an alternative to medical advice from a professional healthcare provider. For the full disclaimer, please see our website. I'm Mike Davalos, just a guy, your average Joe, and I'm joined by the opposite of average Brandon Weintraub, a primary care physician. Good morning, Brandon. Good morning, Mike. Our topic for today is alcohol, and unlike most of our topics on random disorders and diseases, this is one that the average person is likely to have had at least a little experience with. Alcohol's been around for a long time and was probably one of the first drugs that humanity discovered on the long road to civilization. Now, we've touched on alcohol before in the episode on fermented foods, and as we mentioned back then, there are even some theories that indicate that one of the incentives to quit the hunter-gatherer lifestyle and start farming full-time was to have a steady supply of alcohol. It's easy to imagine that these early humans were simply looking for a good buzz at the end of a long, hard day, but water quality might have been a factor. Brandon, what can you tell us about that? We definitely mentioned this in our episode on fermented foods, but for those listeners who haven't had a chance to listen in on that episode yet, I'll hit the highlights. When you're a hunter-gatherer, you're on the move an awful lot. You follow the herds, your primary food source, wherever they may go. Chances are you'll eventually find a source of clean, moving water, especially since the animals themselves will be needing somewhere to drink along their migratory paths. However, regardless of how hard you might try to drink from only the best water sources, there is the constant risk of drinking from a source that is contaminated enough to cause serious illness to your average human being. Enter fermented beverages. The fermentation process, which creates alcohol, has the additional benefit of killing a number of those possible contaminants. In short, there is the distinct possibility that the discovery and ongoing use of alcoholic beverages may have its roots in providing a safer, maintainable source of hydration. That's right, and for early beer, some of this stuff had very little alcohol in it, perhaps just enough to make it slightly safer than some questionable water. And it took humans a surprisingly long time to figure out that sewage and drinking water were a dangerous combination, even if a lot of that sewage was from a herd of antelope you're downstream of. Now, it turns out from my research, there are actually a lot of different types of alcohol, around 20, depending on how finely you want to categorize them. So which one is the type that we're drinking from a bottle of beer or a glass of wine? And how does the complex chemistry from some fermented grape juice make me all warm and tingly, loose and lovey? 20 types of alcohol? Does that include the varieties available on the shelf at your local shop, like vodka and gin? Or do you mean that there are 20 different molecular combinations of alcohol that actually differentiate them? Sorry, sir. I should have been more specific. With around 20 types, I'm referring to the chemical formulas. So, methanol, butane 1, pentane 1, certain varieties of propane, something called heptane. It really does go on and on. There's even giant clouds of exotic alcohols in the far reaches of space. So, which one do we drink? That's synthahol, right? Not synthahol, good sir. That's from Star Trek, a beverage which provides the same intoxicating effects of alcohol without the negative side effects of a hangover, and which allows intoxication to be cleared away almost immediately just by taking a pill. In case you haven't guessed, that doesn't exist in reality yet. The first two primary categories of alcohol are isopropyl and methyl. You need to make sure never to imbibe either sort. Isopropyl alcohol is more commonly known as uh, rubbing alcohol and is primarily used for its effectiveness as a sterilizing agent. Methyl alcohol is used primarily as an industrial solvent. The alcohol we're most interested in today, ethyl alcohol is produced during the fermentation process for every type of beverage from wine to absinthe. During the fermentation process, various varieties of microorganisms break down glucose from whatever's being used in the primary mash. For example, the sugar from grapes used to produce wine, to create energy for themselves. And the chemistry involved in this process creates ethanol as a byproduct. Thank you, tiny creatures. I don't drink all that much, but I agree. Thanks, little critters. So, now that we've got that out of our systems, uh, tell me a bit more about how ethanol, a simple metabolic byproduct, can cause someone to experience gentle physical relaxation, emotional fluctuation, memory issues, loss of consciousness, and any number of other side effects. That's a key question, right? As with every time you've asked me a, how does this work exactly question, I've got to answer, 
there's no complete explanation yet. A lot of more modern research is focused on acetaldehyde. It's a byproduct of the breakdown of ethyl alcohol by the body. While the liver does the majority of the work when it comes to metabolizing, breaking down, alcohol, some studies have shown that other organs, including the pancreas, brain, and gastrointestinal tract also play a role. And the buildup of this byproduct, when administered to lab animals, has been shown to lead to incoordination, memory impairment, and sleepiness, effects often associated with alcohol. However, there are arguments that the concentration of acetaldehyde in the brain isn't sufficient to create the effects we see from drinking. Speaking of concentration, I should have thought to mention this before, but do you want to turn this episode into a drinking game? Like, every time I ask a question, we'll both take a shot. Things could get pretty interesting near the end, huh? Huh? Just picture us all sloshed, singing some old sea shanties, all happy and crying, projectile vomiting, sharing secrets. Yeah, bonding, man! Woo! While I admit that might make for an entertaining episode, I think it would likely be unwise, especially for our health. Moderation, sir. Moderation. Ah, right. That's probably just as well. Uh, I'm not actually a drinker in any way. I've got an old jug in the cupboard of some alcohol to use in cooking, but I don't think that would make for very good shots. Anyway, it seems just like everything else that involves big money, big business, and lobbyists, there's a lot of confusion about what a healthy amount of alcohol is. Sure, there's legal limits on blood alcohol levels, but it might take me more alcohol to break through the legal limit than it would take you, for instance. Now, if I understand what I read correctly, part of the problem seems to be alcohol affects everyone differently. Did I read that right? And if this is true, how does that work? Alcohol in cooking can be great for changing the flavor of your dish, but I bet you didn't know that a decent amount of the alcohol remains in the dish even through the cooking process. Something like 85% of the alcohol added to a dish will still remain even after boiling, and 75% can remain even in a dish like Bananas Foster, where you use a flame to set the alcohol alight. It may not make for a good shot, but even cooking with alcohol can have an effect on your body. The physiological processes of alcohol are the same regardless of the individual, but there are definitely factors that can affect the speed at which alcohol is absorbed and metabolized by the body. Things like weight, height, body type, metabolism, even gender can have an effect on how quickly and how intensely an amount of alcohol can affect a person. Certain medications can also intensify the effects of even small amounts of alcohol. The speed at which alcohol is absorbed into the bloodstream and metabolized by the body can make it so the same amount of alcohol can have significantly different effects on different people. Yeah, you know, alcohol must affect others differently than it affects me. So many people just seem to be really excited by getting a bottle of their favorite spirits. Uh, but for myself, alcohol just puts me to sleep. What about you? Are you a I love you man, peace and love kind of drinker? Usually not so much. I generally become a little bit more likely to interact with people. Alcohol lowers inhibitions, so oftentimes in a social setting, people will feel like they are more able to enjoy themselves, dance when they otherwise wouldn't, or start a conversation with new people. On the rare occasion I have more than a glass or two, I tend to get extremely maudlin. I'm not usually a super fun person. And when it comes to being affected differently, there seems to be a genetic component as well. Some families seem to be able to tolerate alcohol very well. And some clearly can't take more than a little bit before they're smashed, while still other families seem to have a much higher chance to become addicted. Now, what do we know about what's going on with the genetics here? The science and understanding of genetics are still being developed, but there definitely seems to be a strong genetic factor in the development of alcoholism, now officially called alcohol use disorder, or AUD. It seems to run in families, and since you asked the question, it's likely you've at least heard of the alcoholism gene. Research indicates that genetics are likely responsible for about half of the risk for AUD, but that means genes alone do not determine whether someone will develop alcohol use disorder. It also isn't just one gene that increases the statistical risk of developing AUD. Multiple genes appear to play a role on both sides of the equation. In other words, there seem to be genes which increase a person's risk, as well as some that may decrease that risk. Okay, so unsurprisingly, the genetic factors involved are complicated. That's fine. Just take your time and break it all down. For an example, many people of Asian descent carry a gene variant that apparently alters their rate of alcohol metabolism, causing them to have symptoms like flushing, nausea, and rapid heartbeat whenever they drink. As you can imagine, many people who experience these effects avoid alcohol altogether, which helps protect them from developing AUD. What I think is most important for our listeners to know 
is that genetics isn't an on or off situation like scientists used to think. Stimuli from the environment, including what you eat or your exercise levels, your stress, even things like whether your parents or grandparents smoked tobacco can cause chemical changes which can change how your genes manifest themselves. The field of study covering how your genes express themselves is called epigenetics, and I believe it will play the most critical role in developing a detailed and in-depth understanding of how genetics truly play a role in a wide variety of health issues, including development of illnesses like AUD. I read that there are some diets that suggest a glass of wine every day for health purposes. Is this due to some chemical in the alcohol specifically, or something else in the wine? And why can't we just put whatever that little nutrient is into a capsule and just avoid the negative effects of alcohol? Well, first, let me grumble a bit about the reductionist nature of your question. <clears throat> grumble, grumble, just say one useful thing for food. Grumble, grumble, no way it could have possibly affect the long term. Okay, thanks for your patience. I won't go into it right now, but that thought process is one of my few hot buttons. Western medicine epitomizes that kind of reductionist thinking. Find the one active ingredient that allows for a positive effect, isolate it, concentrate it, and then take it in pill form. On one hand, that technique is what allows for the most powerful medications to be made, and why pharmaceuticals can act so quickly. On the other hand, it's also why so many negative side effects come from so many pharmaceuticals, and also why vitamins and supplements end up being ineffective for so many people. Well, let me put my therapist hat on for a second. <clears throat> I think we have to deal with that in another episode. We're talking about a glass of wine a day here, Brandon. Try to stay focused and a little less grumbling. Okay, okay, sorry. I'll be honest. I think a little of my outburst was a desire to avoid having to answer this question. Because research and counter-research on this topic are so varied and intense, I almost feel like it's become one of those running jokes of the medicinal world. Like, whether eggs are good or bad for you. Some research indicates that a single glass of red wine, only red, not white, a night, can have a positive effect on cholesterol levels and reduce the risk of heart attack. In the studies of this specific effect, researchers tend to associate these positive health effects to active substances like polyphenols, uh, quercetin, and resveratrol. Both animal and human studies do seem to support this theory. Additional research has found links to things like improved liver function and increased life expectancy. These are not necessarily caused by the same mechanisms. The improved liver function, for example, seems to be present in both red and white wines. All right. And the negatives? I know they must be coming. Well, still further research has indicated that even half a glass of alcohol can increase the risk of developing breast cancer. There is limited research that seems to indicate that red wine doesn't increase this risk, and other research that shows red wine does, right alongside all the other alcohols. As a medical practitioner, I'm loath to give advice that might lead non-drinkers to start consuming alcohol on a regular basis. The risk of developing alcohol use disorder, or adding risk to potential liver damage down the line? I'm not comfortable saying it's more beneficial to you to start drinking wine regularly for the potential health benefits. I'll go this far, taken as a whole, the research tends to indicate there are at least potential benefits to those who drink wine and even some other alcohols, in moderation. Okay, so red wine might have some good effects. Are there any known health benefits to justify drinking other types of alcohol regularly? Again, there are mixed opinions in research. Light to moderate alcohol consumption has been associated with a number of potential health benefits. I already mentioned improved cholesterol levels. An article in the Journal of Sexual Medicine stated that the chances of developing erectile dysfunction can be reduced by as much as 35% in those who drink alcohol. Additional possible health benefits include a decreased risk of developing Alzheimer's, a reduction in gallstone formation, reduced risk of developing diabetes. One study out of the Department of Psychology at Carnegie Mellon University even indicated that drinking a moderate amount of alcohol regularly reduced a person's risk of catching the common cold. In all your answers so far, I can't help but notice you use the term moderate when you talk about the health benefits of alcohol. I know our listeners would like a little more specificity. What's considered moderate? Uh, two or three pints of beer isn't too bad, is it? I mean, that's the average for people that go to a bar, right? Well, while two pints of beer may or may not be an average amount, I'm afraid that doesn't really match the amount of alcohol generally accepted to be beneficial for your health. First, let me talk about serving size of alcohol. 
When you hear a single glass of wine or a single serving of scotch, the amount being discussed is usually much, much less than your average American thinks. According to overall health standards, a single serving of beer is about 12 ounces, of wine is about 5 ounces, and of distilled spirits, like gin or scotch, is 1.5 ounces or so. So that full glass of wine you pour yourself at home is almost certain to be equivalent to two or more serving-sized glasses. In many studies researching the potential health benefits of alcohol consumption, they do indeed use the term moderate. The definition of moderate, according to the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, is up to four alcoholic drinks a day for men, or three for women, and no more than 14 drinks a week for men, or seven for women. The National Health Service in the United Kingdom generally agrees, no more than three to four drinks a day for men, and no more than two to three drinks per day for women. So, assuming that a person drinks nightly, a moderate amount of alcohol would be two servings a day for men, and one serving a day for women. Keep in mind, there may well be adjustments that have to be made. We already mentioned that alcohol has a different effect on every individual. As an example, a male that has a slender body type and is underweight might have to decrease the number of servings per day to stay within the beneficial ranges. Now wait a minute, but I thought you said I couldn't have two pints. Two servings a day, two pints of beer, I'd be fine. That's exactly why I wanted to go over serving sizes. Yes, beer is frequently served in pints but a single pint is 16 ounces. Drink two of those a day, and by the end of the week, you will end up 56 ounces over the suggested limit. That's 3.5 servings a week. And that isn't taking into account if your beer has a higher alcohol content than those used to provide the serving sizes we've discussed here. The 12 ounces of beer I mentioned as an acceptable serving size relies on that beer containing about 5% alcohol. On the rare occasion I cheat and have a beer, Gluten content may be low, but I do still find some issues even from drinking a single beer. I enjoy porters and stouts, which actually average out anywhere between 7 and 10% alcohol. That means I would need to half my number of drinks right away, even without taking into account any other considerations. Now that we have an idea of what the benefits to drinking alcohol might be, when consumed in the correct amounts, of course, I'd like to take our conversation the other way. Alcohol gets a lot of bad press, especially in car accident news stories. You know, I wonder how this bad press will change as self-driving cars become a real thing. Anyway, what are the long-term health risks when it comes to alcohol, outside of the obvious risks of operating heavy machinery under the influence? Well, just to kick things off, I'll mention that excessive alcohol use is the fourth leading preventable cause of death in the United States. The list of long-term chronic risks associated with excessive alcohol intake are as you might have guessed, pretty lengthy. More or less every organ system is included. Liver damage, pancreatitis, brain damage, stomach ulcers, and gastrointestinal issues are all among the top chronic risks. There's also increased risk of various type of cancers, and it's even been found that drinking in excess can lead to dysfunction of the immune system, which means heavy drinkers can even find themselves at risk of getting sick from infectious diseases more frequently than those who drink more moderately or not at all. Possibly the most concerning aspect of the risks of excess alcohol consumption is the actual lack of short-term indicators and ramifications. Like you said, the bad press alcohol receives is often mostly about some sort of physical catastrophe, like death or injury due to driving under the influence. The health concerns I've listed tend to act as hidden dangers. By the time a person has started to see the signs and symptoms, the damage has already been done, and even if they were to stop drinking overnight, their health is often irreparably damaged. While I was growing up, I never heard much about addiction. I mentioned before that I've lived a sheltered life, but I was an army brat. I lived on military bases for most of my life uh, until I moved away from home. So it wasn't like a lot of the other kids in school had alcoholic parents. I think you'd have to be a very high-functioning alcoholic to maintain yourself for very long at all and still conform to the strict military standards of timeliness, standards of dress, standards of performance. Now, despite my perception as a kid, according to the National Institutes of Health, 47% of active duty service members reported they indulged in binge drinking. And we'll link to this article in the show notes. Of course, an occasional binge doesn't necessarily mean you're an alcoholic. As a kid, what little I did hear was about alcohol, and it wasn't even called addiction. You weren't labeled an addict, you were an alcoholic. Is there some concrete reason for this distinction? 
Am I just stuck in some perspective from the 1970s? Or is this just a typical misunderstanding by the general public? What is an alcoholic? As our listeners may have figured out by now, I'm not entirely comfortable making absolute statements. Even when something seems obvious or well-researched, there's the possibility of what I know, or what I think I know, is wrong. I mention this now because I'm going to go against my nature and say that alcoholism is most certainly a form of addiction as well as a disease, and that alcohol is most certainly a type of drug. The most basic definition of alcoholism sums things up pretty well. Alcoholism is an addiction to the consumption of alcoholic liquor or the mental illness and compulsive behavior resulting from alcohol dependency. Well, there you have it, everyone. Brandon actually managed to give a straightforward answer to a question. Maybe we should just end the episode here. Ha ha. At the very least, let's discuss the other part of your question, because it's always interested me. I have to admit, I've always been somewhat fascinated by alcohol's unusual status in the world of recreational substances. Maybe because it's been around for so long, or maybe because it's so useful in so many different ways, alcohol seems to have received a strange place in public opinion. Alone among all the other recreational drugs on the market, alcohol has found this ethereal place where it's legal to buy and use almost at will, and its abuse is often considered more of a faux pas than it is for actual concern. I don't think you're alone in your experiences regarding the term alcoholic. With other drugs, you're labeled with the word addict right from the start. You'll likely never hear a term like methaholic. In part, I think this comes from the widespread acceptance alcohol is found in our society. If something happens with enough regularity, it can become commonplace, and new words and opinions enter public use. Heroin may be a drug common enough that the average American knows what it is, but few enough people use it that the general populace hasn't had to come up with some sort of euphemism to make the average citizen less uncomfortable when discussing the friends and family that may be abusing it. So there isn't a concrete reason, some little medical factoid you can point to that explains why people who abuse alcohol aren't simply called alcohol addicts. Not that I've ever come across. This might be the case with many addictions, but for some reason it was always stressed in any TV show that would reference alcoholism that just one taste would be all a person needed to relapse. Speaking of TV, I vaguely recall some random TV show, can't even remember what the name was, where these two guys were both competing for a promotion, and one of the candidates was an alcoholic who'd been clean for like 10 years. His professional rival spiked the alcoholic's fruit juice, and the poor guy relapsed. And this was all just to win a promotion at work. Is there any truth in the just one taste is all it takes concept? Most certainly. Take, for instance, our discussion of alcohol use in food. Even though alcohol content is reduced through the cooking process, and then further reduced because the serving size of a recipe is divided among multiple people, even that amount of alcohol can trigger the physiological response in some individuals. Recovering alcoholics are required to possess an amount of vigilance and concern that makes me tired just thinking about it. And it isn't only the physiological component that makes relapse so easy. Alcohol use disorder has a strong psychological component as well, and the emotional response a former addict receives from even a small amount of their substance of choice can lead to a long line of seemingly uncontrollably bad decisions. Alcohol is used in a lot of medicines, isn't it? Sometimes as a base, a component, and or sometimes to help extract essential oils. If you're a recovering alcoholic, do you have to be careful of such medicines? Uh, And a bonus question in this vein. Since alcohol seems to act as something of a solvent to break down complex chemistry, how might this impact foods, spices, and prescriptions I might have taken? I'm not talking about taking sleeping pills with a tall glass of scotch. It could be anything. Alcohol is used in a wide variety of medications, supplements, herbal remedies, you name it. In Chinese medicine, alcohol is ascribed specific qualities and actions on the body all by itself, and is even used to guide other herbal components in a formula to specific organs. A process called tincturing involves soaking herbs in a carrier substance, more often than not alcohol of some variety, to extract the active ingredients and create a form of the medication that is easier for a person to take and potentially more concentrated, so the person can take less at one time. So there's your bonus question answer. Alcohol can act as both an extraction agent and as an active substance in its own right. It also can interact with other pharmaceutical substances. The effects of a medication can be enhanced or reduced depending on how a drug works on the body. 
which is why it's so important to discuss with your doctor the risks of drinking alcohol whenever you're put on something new. And regardless of the application, recovering addicts must avoid products using alcohol as a primary component or use them under observance and with extreme caution. Even something used medically with the best of intentions can cause relapse. Like many other hidden ingredients we've talked about in our foods and drinks, it seems that there can also be alcohol in surprising places. It can be found in flavor extracts like vanilla, also in uh, vinegar, mustard, cooking spray, and more. One of the surprising places i found that has alcohol in it is your beloved kombucha tea, Brandon. What's up with that? Do you take your tea shaken but not stirred? I certainly hope not. When brewed properly, kombucha tea can have nearly as much carbonation as the soft drink of your choice. So, no shaking, unless you want to be the one cleaning up the mess. Seriously, though, for those of our listeners who may not know what kombucha is, it's a beverage made through the use of a SCOBY, or a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, which is placed into a container of sugar-sweetened tea. The bacteria and yeast begin the fermentation process, and in the end, what's left is a somewhat sour, effervescent drink containing probiotics and, yes, some alcohol content. Levels of alcohol in a commercial bottle of kombucha are usually pretty minimal, averaging about 0.5% alcohol by volume. However, certain varieties can contain up to as much as 2.5% alcohol by volume, which is why you'll only find some types of kombucha alongside the beer in your local grocery. Kombucha usually goes through two separate fermentation stages. The first stage, where the bulk of the sugars are converted into alcohol, and the second, where the results of this first fermentation process are separated into smaller, closed containers, and a small amount of additional sugar is added. For example, a piece of fruit can be added to each container to create the fizziness that is part of what makes the drink so enjoyable. There is the option to complete a third stage, where some form of grain is added into the mix which allows the alcohol content to go above the 2.5 to 3% range, which can then be bottled as kombucha ale or probiotic beer. And just like with all our other examples, kombucha can still be a concern for alcoholics, recovering or otherwise, and even people without an alcohol addiction. 0.5% may not seem like very much alcohol, but if consumed in large enough amounts over a short period of time, or by individuals who are more quickly affected by alcohol for any reason. Even kombucha can impair the body and brain. When it comes to one of the more modern takes on alcohol, a popular trend is to use energy drinks, like Red Bull or Monster, as one of the major elements in the mixture. I imagine it would give you something of a jolt to go along with your buzz. But this can be dangerous, right? Extremely dangerous. Probably the most memorable example of this in the recent past is a product called Four Loco. The company, Fusion Projects, caused a fair amount of controversy with the Four Loco product line by combining alcohol, caffeine, taurine, and guarana, potent herbal and chemical products that allowed consumers to be awake like drinking a Red Bull, but it gets you drunk too. Four Loco became available to consumers in 2008, and by 2010, concerns were reaching their peak. It turned out that having jolt with your buzz, as you so aptly put it, also created a situation where memory loss and loss of consciousness were far too frequent. Among the list of other common side effects were paranoia and heart arrhythmias, and hospitalizations of people who had consumed the product weren't uncommon. It isn't fusion projects that needs to shoulder all the blame, though. Anytime a person decides to combine any kind of drug with alcohol, even something as seemingly harmless as caffeine or an herbal stimulant like orana, there are going to be risks. I can't stress enough how important it is to be cautious with the products you consume. Know what the risks are and use moderation, especially when alcohol is involved. And here's something else that never would have occurred to me to do. Apparently, some folks like to have a few drinks before they go run a 5K or a half marathon, and that's dangerous too, unsurprisingly. I really hope this isn't actually happening. Alcohol acts as a diuretic and can cause issues with the body's ability to self-regulate temperature and electrolytes. And while alcohol may provide calories and the potential to protect your heart, that's over long term and in moderation, not when actively exercising. One of the ways alcohol is trying to give itself a modern twist of lemon? No, it's about a new delivery method, something called aerosolized alcohol, where you turn it into a very fine mist and inhale it. 
Now, as someone who takes caffeine pills on a regular basis, I get the idea of wanting a drug's effects without necessarily wanting to take the time and effort and calories to drink the beverage that typically delivers the drug. Now, if I personally had any interest at all in getting drunk, maybe a few puffs on an alcohol atomizer would be my weapon of choice. But here's another shock. Aerosolized alcohol might not be the smartest idea, right? I'm glad we got to this question, because I've had an interest in vaporized alcohol ever since I read an article on it back when I was still in school. The concept is a fascinating one. Rather than drinking the liquid you might have in, say, a gin and tonic, use a device to put the gin into gaseous form and inhale it. Instead of going through your digestive system, the alcohol enters more or less directly into the bloodstream. In terms of recreational use, I could see the potential benefits. The effects of your drink would come on much sooner and with much less alcohol required. The article that I read also stated that the effects would wear off sooner, in something like 15 minutes if I recall correctly. For some partiers out there, that may sound like a detriment, but to me, if someone could go out for a drink, sit and chat for 15 minutes, and then be completely sober again and able to drive safely home, I would call that a win. That sounds pretty beneficial to me, but I want to know about the risks though. First and foremost, the lungs aren't designed to inhale liquids or process solid materials. So inhaling small particles of vaporized alcohol will potentially cause long-term and, as yet unforeseen, issues with the lungs. There's also an increased risk of overdose. It would be all too easy for someone to inhale excess alcohol even before they feel the first effects. One of the only ways the body can remove excess alcohol is by vomiting. When drinking alcohol, this has the ability to remove additional alcohol that may still remain undigested in the stomach. With vaporized alcohol, the vomit reflex won't help. That alcohol went straight into the bloodstream. And since the liver is also taken out of the equation, that alcohol went straight into the bloodstream, remember. The body could end up building up toxic levels extremely quickly. You mentioned that you became interested in vaporized alcohol during school. I'd love to hear what caught your interest about that in school. You were looking for some new way to party, weren't you? You animal! I've never been much of a partier. My initial thoughts during school had been to use this concept to more quickly and effectively deliver herbal medicines into the body. Create a tincture of customized herbals for the patient. Vaporize and inhale, and there you go. Quick and concentrated delivery of a formula suited for the patient. Oh, I should have known. Between party animal and studious healer, which way you'd fall. Indeed. But it turns out herb dosages are tried and tested for the digestive system, not for direct delivery into the lungs. And since the precise mechanisms of action for many of the herbal remedies isn't fully understood, I decided the risks of delivering an herbal formula through vaporization were just too high. Okay, now one of the more weird and interesting factoids I came across in my research was something called auto-brewery syndrome. And no, this isn't brewing beer in a car. This is auto as in self. Huh, like erotica. Huh. Anyway, to put it simply, this is where your own digestive system turns into a fermentation tank. Well, kind of already is, in everyone. Uh, But in this syndrome, it turns you into a human beer-making creature. Uh, And before you say I'm crazy, I double-checked this at the FDA website and the National Institutes of Health. This isn't some made-up thing someone fabricated for Wikipedia. Your own body can make you drunk, without you ever drinking anything. How does this happen? And what could a person do to fix the problem if they had it? I know you aren't crazy or making this one up, because I actually had a chance to co-treat a patient who had this very condition during my internship. Auto-brewery syndrome, or gut fermentation syndrome, is a result of the overgrowth of candida in your digestive system. That's the type of yeast commonly associated with yeast infections. In the presence of sugars, this overgrowth does exactly what you'd expect yeast to do, convert it into energy and alcohol. In the case of the patient I helped treat, the gentleman found he was experiencing side effects of being drunk without ever touching a drop of alcohol. Fast forward through a ton of Western tests, and lo and behold, a digestive system full of candida. Treatment can be a lengthy process and involves a significant change in diet. Low sugar, low starch, only non-glutinous grains. A good probiotic with a high bacteria count is also critically important. In severe cases, Antifungals may need to be used. Natural antifungals that some practitioners suggest include things like oregano oil, and food-level treatments include coconut oil. In my research, I came across some articles that said getting weight loss surgery can increase your chances of alcoholism. Can you break that down for us? 
I hadn't heard about this one before you brought the article to my attention. It's a worrisome little article. According to a study out of the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health, patients who received bariatric surgery, a means of weight loss that surgically adjusts the size of your stomach and the connections to the intestines, have shown a significant increase in the likelihood to experience addiction to alcohol. 21% of patients develop a drinking problem. That's a little more than one in five. And the problems with alcohol are apparently still being found as much as seven years after the surgery itself. What's the most worrying about this article is a bit of information towards the end. Apparently, of all the patients that have received the bariatric surgery in question, only 3.5% have reported they have gotten any kind of substance abuse treatment, meaning that 17.5% of these patients are experiencing problems with alcohol addiction, but not seeking or receiving the help they need. Whenever I think about alcoholism, which isn't often, I'll admit, I always think about something called antabuse, which is apparently a drug that makes you very sick if you drink alcohol. And this was used way back in the day to try to curb alcoholism. I'm sure you've heard of this. I have indeed, and it's still used in the present day. The generic name of the drug is disulfiram, and it works by stopping the liver from breaking down that substance we talked about earlier, acetaldehyde. That causes an almost instantaneous set of symptoms resembling a hangover as soon as alcohol is imbibed. It can actually be an effective treatment. It provides that extra encouragement for someone on the edge that needs a physical component to help keep them from abusing alcohol. The downsides are just as significant as you might have guessed, though. There are side effects when even just on the medication. Headaches, dizziness, fatigue, sleep issues. It also interacts with a fair number of other drugs, including acetaminophen, a common painkiller, and even various foods and non-alcoholic beverages. Antabuse doesn't remove cravings for alcohol, so although it might help curb cravings, the desire to drink will still be as strong as ever. And finally, patients aren't always compliant in using the medication. It may be an effective assistant to alcohol addicts really wanting to change their lives, but only if the patient actually takes the medication regularly. So that's one of the classic methods. What's the current Western treatment like for someone recovering from alcohol addiction? Treatment for alcohol addiction is currently a combination of many different stages and forms of treatment. The first stage of treatment is essentially alcohol detoxification. Withdrawal symptoms from alcohol can be intense and dangerous, and in some cases it can even cause death. In severe cases, a patient will be hospitalized before they begin the detoxification and withdrawal process so that medical professionals can keep careful watch on the patient's overall health. The stages after this first step are varied and can take different forms. Options include psychological counseling, oral or injectable medications, including things like antabuse, which we've just talked about at length, spiritual practices, and treatment for symptoms and health conditions that may be a result of long-term drinking or part of the ongoing process of recovering from the results of alcohol abuse. Maintaining sobriety is considered a lifelong endeavor and many recovering addicts will be part of programs like Alcoholics Anonymous for much, if not the rest of their lives. Now, if one of your patients came in for help with alcoholism, what would be the Eastern medicine approach? Besides the use of pharmaceuticals, the treatment actually looks remarkably similar. In severe or long-term alcohol use disorder, I would still suggest that the patient go to a Western medical facility. Like I said, the withdrawal symptoms when weaning off alcohol are not to be underestimated, and emergency care may be required. It's better to be safe than sorry, and as I've said before, Western medicine excels in being able to treat emergency situations. Once past this initial stage of withdrawal, a patient will want to include a wide variety of medical professionals in their treatments. Western practitioners are already referring patients to acupuncture physicians as part of their treatment regimens. There are acupuncture treatments that can help recovering addicts in a plethora of ways, not only by reducing cravings and minimizing withdrawal symptoms, but some practitioners believe proper treatment can even help patients by calming their nervous system and easing their emotional connections to alcohol. It's coming. I can feel it. You're about to mention herbs. Right you are. Instead of pharmaceutical drugs, there are herbal remedies that studies have shown to be effective in aiding a patient to achieve their goals to be alcohol-free. One such option, a plant called gogen, or kudzu, was shown in a study in 2003 to curb alcohol dependence in mice, 
and in a small study in 2005 to reduce alcohol cravings in humans. As effective as acupuncture and herbal medicine can be, I would still strongly urge patients to try any of the additional options available to recovering addicts. There isn't a magical solution that will let a person wave a wand and remove the behaviors, desires, and complications that result from long-term alcohol use. Patients will need all the help they can get to successfully remain clean and sober. In case y'all were wondering, yes, that's the same kudzu that's a well-known invasive plant species, often considered a noxious weed spreading through the U.S. from the deep south to as far north as Illinois at a rate of about 2,500 acres per year. It's an interesting plant, and you should take a look at our link. We keep coming back to a drug called ketamine in these episodes, and it came up again in my research on alcohol. It seems that in this instance, uh, ketamine is being studied for its possible use in targeted memory loss to help prevent relapses in alcohol addiction and rehabilitation cases. Can you explain this to us in simple terms? Tell us, is this likely to become a standard treatment anytime soon? Jeez, you know, I hadn't heard about this one yet either. Thanks for sending me the link. Although, I will say right off the bat here that I can't see this particular application of ketamine becoming a feasible treatment for alcoholics for a long while, if ever. Researchers at University College London are apparently testing to find if a one-time dose of ketamine, a drug used in conjunction with other medications as an anesthetic during surgery, can be used to selectively remove memories of alcohol use in individuals who drink excessive amounts of alcohol but do not meet any of the criteria to be diagnosed with alcohol use disorder. Their methodology sounds straightforward. Participants in the study will have their memories of alcohol activated, by doing something like putting them in the presence of a tall glass of beer, and then the participant will be distracted. The researchers didn't disclose how they were planning to distract the participant for fear of invalidating the test, but went on to say that the patient would then be given a dose of ketamine. A similar experiment conducted by researchers out of the University of Amsterdam, albeit with a different drug, was successful in reducing phobia to spiders in a small group of test participants, so who knows? I'll be interested to read the results of this particular study. It's kind of an odd approach. Maybe it has something to do with repetitive thinking and associations, like dopamine reinforcement, like wanting a cigarette after dinner or wanting chips and dip with your favorite TV show. Okay, so I saved a couple of opinion questions for last. Seems like there's a growing movement, a lot of new legislation recently that would loosen a lot of old alcohol-related laws, allowing sales on Sunday, more availability on college campuses, even Amazon delivering alcohol. It's easy to imagine that the more accessible alcohol is, the more problems there are going to be. Any thoughts on that? I'm honestly not sure. My first thought was to find a historical parallel, and I immediately thought of prohibition here in the U.S. from 1920 to 1933. Whether the prohibition of alcohol during this period was a failure is a topic historians are still arguing, and I'm not really bringing it up to discuss its usefulness, success, or lack thereof. Statistically, During Prohibition, alcohol consumption rose 60 to 70 percent above its pre-prohibition levels. Is that sharp increase directly related to alcohol's sudden illegality? A function of a natural trend that had begun prior to Prohibition? I doubt anyone can say for certain. But I do know for a fact that the frisson of excitement people experience at doing something they shouldn't be doing is all too real. So simply limiting access to alcohol isn't going to limit its abuse. I think it might be more important to make sure that, if alcohol is more accessible and easier to obtain, that education and quality of product is made equally available. During Prohibition, moonshine distilled by enterprising but underexperienced people were frequently poisonous and could cause severe injury and death. Rather than force people to risk unregulated, unsafe products, I think it might actually be better that safe alcoholic products be made available, and that from an early age, we include education on alcohol, its effects, its benefits, how it can be used responsibly, and how to recognize and treat issues of abuse and overuse. I forget where I heard this concept originally, but I think we can easily apply it to alcohol. Given what we know about the risks and dangers, if alcohol was invented for the first time in some lab in the year 2017, would it ever be allowed to become as widespread in culture as it is now. This just seems unlikely to me. Again, I I just don't know. There are herbs which have been around, even used medicinally, which have recently been made illegal to purchase. Not just medical marijuana, which I'm sure is one of the first examples most people would think of today, but other herbs as well, 
mahuang, an herb which has long been used in Chinese medicine, has been banned for sale in the U.S. due to misuse by a fairly small number of people. I think there's a tendency to want to overprotect the general populace in the U.S., which I believe stems in large part from the litigious nature of the average American citizen. So, I have to say, I'd agree with you. If alcohol were to be newly introduced into our lives now, I'd bet that among all the fighting about who could produce it or prescribe it, the fears and testing of its negative effects on the body, and lack of complete understanding about its mechanisms, alcohol would more than likely be consigned to be considered a controlled substance with little to no legal acceptance. Is there anything else you want to mention about alcohol before we wrap it up? I think we've done a pretty good job covering a wide range of important questions and considerations regarding a substance which can be found in almost every home, grocery store, restaurant in the United States. I don't think it's useful to look at alcohol as inherently good or bad. When drunk in moderation and in a safe environment, alcohol can act as a social lubricant and potentially provide health benefits. When used to excess or by those with a genetic, physiological, or psychological drive towards alcohol addiction, it can have disastrous results. As with almost everything else in life, caution and moderation are the watchwords when considering drinking an alcoholic beverage be it for recreational reasons or medicinal purposes. Very long story short, enjoying the occasional beer, wine, or mixed drink isn't something you necessarily need to feel guilty about. Alcohol isn't likely to disappear from the shelves anytime soon, so just make sure you're aware and educated and know what is best for your personal situation. Great. Anybody who's interested in Mike and Brandon's Personal Health Goals Corner should stick around and listen after the music. That's all the time we have for today. These short episodes are a brief overview of very complex topics. Everything we say is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Licensed healthcare professionals should advise you and be aware of changes you're planning to make to any aspect of your healthcare. Every person's needs are different. The links to references we've made about news articles, medical studies, or other materials can be found at level989.com, along with our contact information and a complete Don't Take Medical Advice from Podcasts disclaimer. Don't forget to take a moment to rate or review us in iTunes or give us a mention on social media. We can inform everyone if they don't know we exist. Thanks for listening, and now go health yourself. All right, Brandon, it's been about two weeks since we last took a look at our own health. Personal health is such a broad topic, I thought we might break it into a few attributes that we can discuss in specific. So how about sleep, diet, and exercise? Since our last recording, I've been trying to get more sleep. I probably managed to get an extra two or three hours per week. So that would put me at around seven hours per night rather than six. Uh, how about on your end? How's the sleeping? I think I've managed to increase my hours by about four or so a week. Whoa. So I'm actually getting six to seven hours a night. You know, most nights. That's a great improvement. That is. Next up is diet. And I've made a conscious effort to eat at least half as many carbs. And as a result, I've been eating a lot more protein. Chicken breast mostly, a little olive oil drizzled on it. You know, protein might be filling, but it does not give you the quick burst of energy that carbs do. I haven't seen any change in my weight yet. It's still hovering within a few pounds of 200 pounds, that's 91 kilos. How's your food working out? Really, food has been about the same as the last few months. I had started to go back to eating a little bit too much sugar. I got back on track pretty quickly. And I'm definitely feeling better without all those delicious, delicious desserts weighing me down. I've been less than good about my lack of gluten, though. Um, excuses, excuses. I had friends in town for about a week, and they were interested in going to a local brewery. Huh, appropriate for the episode. Unfortunately, it is very close to my house. And even more unfortunately, the place is impressive. Nice ambiance, great staff, and especially worthwhile microbrews. Three nights over the course of the week, I tried, you know, two different varieties of beer, which is way too much gluten for me, uh, not to mention too many calories. Wow, who knew? Now, as for exercise, I have not increased it any, I have to admit. I tracked my steps at work a few days last week. Looks like I'm doing around 8,200 steps at work, according to my Apple Health app. Now, there's a lot of times, especially doing chores around the house, that I don't have my phone in my pocket, so I'm probably hitting the 10,000 steps minimum goal that you hear talked about on various health blogs. Uh, I still haven't replaced my broken treadmill, 
So unless the 95 degree weather takes a surprising turn, I'm not going to be walking or jogging outside anytime soon. How has your exercise been going? I think I saw at least a few 5K runs by you in the My Fitness Pal uh, that we're both buddies in. Honestly, I wish I had been doing as well as you have. Up to the visit with my friends, I had actually been doing a 5K run four to five times a week. Wow. Uh, then my friends arrived, and uh, I ended up spending my time being a decent host instead of going to the gym. E- even worse, this particular podcast on alcohol took a ton of time for me to prepare. So a lot of the hours I ordinarily would have spent heading to the gym were actually spent sitting answering questions. I know, not good, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be better. I'm back on track, and I did a, a nice run yesterday. And uh, actually, as soon as we finish recording, I'll be uh, heading over to do some strength training. Great. I, I guess we're going to have to choose uh, easier topics going forward. Okay, now it wraps up Health Corner. I know a lot of folks out there are working hard on their own health goals, so let us know if there's anything that works especially well for you that we should try. And good luck to all of us. Bye for now.